first and foremost, I want to thank our pastor for uh, giving me the opportunity. I want to thank my church family. Um, I have realized the last couple of weeks how important it is to have a church family. And there are some of you in here tonight and some that aren't able to be here tonight that have, I personally have had to rely on and, and um, trust them and go to them with situations that have happened. And it's important to have a good church family. We should be thankful that we have a pastor that feeds us and people in this church that care about each other and take care of each other. I realized the importance of um, when I first answered the call to preach and I talked to pastor, he said, Satan's coming after you. And I took that lightly at first. And I'll tell you once, tell you something. I've, I've had some experiences here in the past, past couple months that were, were not fake and they were, they were extremely real. And I have to, had to rely on this church. I've had to, had to rely on my pastor and some of the people in here to pray for me and to care for me. And I just thank you. Those, those of you know exactly, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But it is important and it is a blessing to have a church family that cares for each other and, and protects each other and bears each other's burdens and, and prays together and is there when, when we need each other. Um, thank you, Pastor, for giving me the opportunity to preach. I've uh, been at a camp meeting all week. Uh, went up there Monday in Greenville, Tennessee, and um, seen some souls saved. It's been amazing. It's been wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm having the privilege to preach up there tomorrow, and there have been tremendous preachers come through from North Carolina, West Virginia, all, all over the place. It pretty much seems like all we're doing is sitting in that building and listening to preaching after preaching after preaching, and we don't get tired of it. It's been good. God has been good, awesome, and, and, and faithful. It's been encouraging in the, day, in the day that we live in. I love that story of the letter that Pastor was reading of whoever it was that, that sent us that letter. I preached a sermon this past Sunday morning on, on that exact topic of uh, how Paul was in that boat and everyone went crazy. The world went crazy around and people wanted to get out of the big boat and they wanted to get in a little boat and they were in a big storm and it, it's just crazy how Paul has that faith to push forward. We, we, we need that faith. I'm preaching on something tonight that has been very burdened on my heart. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Galatians chapter chapter number 6, and then if you put your finger there in Galatians chapter number 6, and turn over to James chapter number 4 as well, we're going to be reading in Galatians first, and then we're going to go to James chapter number 4. In Galatians chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 4, it says, But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burdens. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is true. We have a just God, and he's watching you. There's no secrets. There's no doing something that you think God can't see and God's not watching you. He knows your heart. He knows your intentions. Verse number 8 says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for another opportunity to preach your word. God, I pray that you'd give me the exact words that I need. God, make me disappear. Fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive me of the things I've done wrong. God, just use me. I'm nothing without you. I need your power and I need your might. I pray that I would say everything you want me to and nothing that you don't. You're a good God. I pray that you would fill this room, this building with the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in your son's perfect and precious name that I pray. Amen. I'm preaching on something tonight that's kind of harsh. It's kind of aggressive. Some would say I'm mean for preaching a sermon like this, but this is a burden on my heart. In today's world, being a young person, going to the camp meeting I've been at, I've seen a lot of young preachers my age preaching and it's encouraging. But then I go around after this camp meeting and, and the people in the church, we, we, we need to realize something. We need to learn something. The fields will harvest. Okay, God knows everything you're doing. God knows your intentions. He's watching you. He loves you and he cares for you, but he is watching you. And if there's one thing that is extremely scary to me in today's world, especially within the church, is that we have so many Christians giving up something they don't even realize they have. For something that their flesh wants. Now God tells us that we will, we will reap corruption if we sow the flesh. I'm going to talk about a few different people in the Bible who gave up what they had. They got what they wanted. 
And, and, and let me tell you, your flesh wants a lot of things. And a lot of times you, you want it really bad and it's really hard to say no to your flesh. But there are a lot of people in the Bible, and I'm only going to go to three different people in Scripture, who gave up what they had. And they almost didn't even realize what they had until they gave it up for what their flesh wanted. And why not start in the beginning with Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve, God had, uh, had created the Garden of Eden, and they were living in all knowledge. They had innocence. God gave them all these trees and all these fruits to eat from. And there was one tree that God said, don't eat of that tree. Don't eat that fruit. The first mistake Adam and Eve made was hanging around the wrong tree. Now, in the church house today, as sad as it may be, sometimes the worst thing you can do is hang out with some of the people in your church because they are what's getting you in your flesh. Amen. I hate when I come to the church or when I come to a meeting or when I go anywhere that is connected with the church and I leave more discouraged than when I came. That's because you, the, the, the people there, and, and I'm guilty of it as well, we sow our flesh and we give our flesh what it wants and, and we don't realize what we're about to lose. We don't realize what we're about to lose. What did Adam and Eve lose? They lost their innocence, friend. Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. And Adam just followed right after her. That's what we tend to do in this world. Adam and Eve lost their innocence. They gave up living humbly perfect, walking around naked with no perversion in their minds. Could you imagine if I got naked right now? All the thoughts that would go around or, or if anyone walked in here naked. Let me tell you something. Adam and Eve walked around naked, humbly perfect, because there was no mistake that had been made. God gave them one rule. Don't eat of that tree. And they gave into their flesh, and they lost their innocence. We lose our innocence very often in the church, my friend. A lot of times it's the older people who cause the younger people to lose their innocence. Because they decide to, to sow their flesh, and, and the younger people are watching the older people. At, at the camp I've, I've been at this week, I've seen there, there's some real juniors, like, like, I mean, eight, nine, ten years old. And I watch them run around, and they'll say something. I'll say, hey, why did you say that? Where did you hear that from? They'll name an older person in their group. Sometimes they're naming the youth pastor or the pastor. And they're saying, they said that. You're making that little boy lose his innocence. You're making that little girl lose their innocence. Adam and Eve gave up their innocence for their flesh. They gave in to what they wanted, but they lost being humbly perfect. They lost what God had given them. And look what we're suffering from that now. Now we have to fight our flesh every single day, minute after minute, hour after hour. And it is hard to fight your flesh. Your flesh has a lot of wants. Adam and Eve were not the only people who gave up their flesh, who gave up what they had for what they wanted in the flesh. But I want to point out in, in the book of Judges, in the book of Judges, we have a character in the Bible named Samson. Samson was, had the power of God. Samson had the power of God. He killed a thousand men with the jawbone. He, he killed a thousand men by himself. He ripped the lion apart with his bare hands. He had the power of God on him. Now, it may look different now. Let, let me explain what the power of God needs to look like. Is when you go to a meeting and you can feel the Holy Spirit there. Now, we have a pastor who studies and prays and cares. And he takes his time to, to study and give us what, what he has. And there are times when, when he's preaching that the Holy Spirit comes directly to me. Let me tell you something. Samson had the power of God. He had God's hand on him. What did he decide to do, though? He started flirting with the devil. Amen. Samson flirted with the devil. The devil was pretty. The devil was attractive. The devil knew how to get him. The devil knew. What did he do? He started playing little tricks with her. Delilah. You know the story. Most of you probably know the story. Samson started flirting with Delilah. Now, the reason Samson had his power is because he followed the rules. He was not to take strong drink. He was not to touch a dead animal. And he was not to cut his hair. The power he had came from obedience to God. Samson obeyed God. Samson had what most of us would beg for. I wish I could kill a thousand men by myself. I'd get killed by most of, most of the men in here. I'm nothing. But what did Samson decide to do? He decided to flirt with the devil. We have a lot of Christians who are flirting with the devil. We have a lot of people who are flirting with Satan. We may not see it in the church. We, you may be really good at hiding it. And you may think that you're the only one that knows. But you're about to give up something way more important than what your flesh wants. Because one day we're leaving this world. One day we're going to glory land. One day we're going to meet Jesus in the sky. And it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be wonderful. But what did your life look like here? What are you doing now? Don't give up 
Don't give up what you have for what you want. You can have sweet, sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. You can have the power of God on you. Not just men. The ladies can have the power of God on them. Why would you want to give that up to flirt with the devil? Now, we flirt with the devil in a lot of ways. Some Christians flirt with the devil with with drugs and and alcohol. And and some of the men are flirting with the devil just like Samson with a woman. And you may think nobody knows. God is watching you. You're about to reap what you sow. God knows what you're doing. God knows. And you're about to give up something way more important, friend. You're about to give up something far, far more important than what your flesh wants. It is hard to fight the flesh. I've caught myself in situations, uh, a specific one recently, where I turned around and I was thinking, how in the world did I get here? How did this happen? Let me tell you, I almost gave up everything I had. I almost gave up the opportunity to preach. I almost gave up everything because I decided to start flirting with the devil a little bit. And then God, God talked to me. God told me. I, I met with some people in this church and, and I poured my heart out. I said, this, this happened. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how I got there. I don't know what's happening. And they prayed with me. And I called, I called my friends and my, the pastor friends I have that, that, that aren't even in this state. And they prayed with me and they cared for me. Let me tell you something, friend. The scariest moment of my life was when I almost gave up what I have. I almost gave up the ministry. I almost gave up the opportunity to preach the word of God. I almost gave up the, the, the innocence that, that I have for something that my flesh wants. Samson flirted with the devil. Are you flirting with the devil today? Are you flirting with the devil tonight? It may look different in all y'all's lives. I may not have named how you're flirting with the devil, but you know it in your mind. You know it in your heart. We need to decide today to say, God, I'm not going to give in to the flesh. We hope he's coming soon, and I believe that he is, but we are still here. I want to be in heaven just as much as the next guy, but we are still here. You can still fall. It doesn't matter how big, how powerful you are. Samson was a strong man, but he decided to flirt with the devil. There are great preachers in the the past who, who, I mean, they could call someone and say, I'm free Tuesday. 4,000 people would show up that Tuesday night to watch him preach. And some of them flirted with the devil. They're in prison now. They're not in the pulpit no more. They had the power of God, but they decided to flirt with the devil. They gave up everything they had. You may not be a preacher. You may not be up here singing, but you have fellowship with God if you're a Christian. Now, our pastor says salvation is a person that enters inside of you. You are only as close to someone as as much time as you spend with that person. I'm close to my family because I choose to go hang out with my brothers. Me and my brother went to the lake this past weekend, and it was awesome. But we grow a bond between that because I choose to spend time with him. Jesus is the same way. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit entered inside of you. Now, he can be your best friend or he can be a friend that you ain't seen in 25 years. Think about that. Think about that. The closer you are to him, the safer you are, friend. The safer you are from giving up everything you have for what you want. It's easy to get what you want. It's easy to get what you want. Your flesh is convincing you. It's a fight every single day. The last person I want to talk about is David. David. Who's David? Man after God's own heart. The reason I chose David last is because David also proves to us that even when you've gotten in this state, you can get back. You can make it back. Now, there are consequences to what you've given into, but you can get back to God if you choose to. What did David give up? What did David choose to give up? Adam and Eve gave up their innocence. Samson gave up the power of God on him. He decided to to let God take his hand off of him because he wanted something. He decided to go after something his flesh wanted. It's not worth it, friend. It's not worth it. God is more important. And if you haven't had sweet fellowship with God, you don't know what I'm talking about. But there are some people in this building that I have personally talked to, and they tell me that the fellowship with God is so sweet. It's so precious. It makes you almost excited to die because you know you're going to be with him. Don't give up what what you have, friend. It ain't worth it. David... Gave up what he had for what he wanted as well. What happened to David? Almost a similar situation, except David went a little bit further. David went a little bit further. What was David's first problem? He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. I know that the Bible may not specifically say that we need to come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But I will beg to say you need it because I know I need it. It don't matter how much I dig into the word and I study myself. I need to come to church. Let God use my pastor to feed me, friend. David was not where he needed 
to be at that time. Us as Christians, we know where we're supposed to be. You know where you're supposed to be. Don't flirt with the line. You need to make it black and white. I have friends who say, well, oh, they, they argue how alcohol might not be bad uh, in the Bible. They've got some pretty good arguments, not going to lie. But why would you even want to flirt with the line? That's what it always comes down to. Is, is, is if there's a gray line in the middle, why would you want to straggle that line? Amen. When you have the option to fall and fall hard and fall fast. Make it black and white. If you can't do that, then you need to pray and say, God, make it clear what I need to do, where I need to be, and when. Idle hands is the devil's workshop. I remember when I broke my ankle. I was playing basketball in middle school. I broke my ankle. My mom took me to KOC, I, I reckon, and the, the doctor was a Christian. The man that, you know, told me, well, you messed it up, was a Christian. He said, now, you can walk on this cast, and you need to, because idle hands are the devil's workshop. Is the devil's workshop. I'll never forget that. I will never forget that. At this camp I've been at, we've had boys lay their phone on the altar and leave it there because they have a struggle with that phone and they decide to give it up. Now, when you're idle, you tend to make a mistake. That's what David did. He wasn't where he needed to be. He was all on his own. And then he looked off and he saw a beautiful woman. A beautiful woman. He had the option right then to say, I'm not going to do it. But what did he do? He gave in to the flesh. And he decided to give up everything he had. He was a king. He had purity. He gave it up for his flesh, friend. He gave it up. He slept with Bathsheba. And not only that, but to cover that up, he decided to murder a man. Sin covers up sin, covers up sin, covers up sin, covers up sin. I could say it a thousand times. Before you know it, you're somewhere you wish you'd never been. Don't flirt with the devil. Don't walk the gray line. Make it black. And why? The field will harvest. God is watching you. You will reap what you sow. It may be secret now. You may think nobody knows about it now. But God knows. The Almighty knows. You will reap what you sow, friend. Do not flirt with the devil. It's not worth it. Know where you need to be. David was in the wrong place. If you have the personality where you know you're going to be whoever you are with whoever you're hanging out with, then you need to know who to hang out with. We know our flesh. When I was younger, whoever I was with, that's what I was acting like. It took me a long time to realize I need to act the same way all the time. I need to be me. I need to follow God. I need to follow the Ten Commandments. I need to do my best no matter who I'm around. Some of you don't. We're all made different. It's not a bad thing. It just means you need to Know who to hang around. Don't bend with who you're with. That's flirting with the devil. You're deciding to, to just give up a little bit for the devil. It's not worth it. You're going to lose something way more important. Way more important. Now, you will never lose your salvation. God will never break relationship with you. But you can break fellowship. Peter broke fellowship with God. He denied him three times. And God had to go up to him and say, do you love me? I, imagine how that would feel. Once you decide to flirt with the devil and give it up, and you have to come to the altar and say, God, I love you, and you almost have to question if he believes you. Don't even get there. Don't walk the gray line. Make it black and white. Don't, don't give up what you have for what you want. It's not worth it. Samson played tricks with the devil. David decided to, he decided to give in and, and made a lot of mistakes, and I... I heard someone one time say, well, David did a lot of things, but what happened to David? What you do doesn't always just affect you, friend. There's a lot of things that happen to David's family. You read that Bible. You get in there. You open it. You read what happened to David's family. It's some wicked things. It's some sad things. It's some things that would tear you apart if you even thought about it happening in today's world. And it is happening because God is judging the immorality of this world. We wonder where the power of God is. I hear people all the time say, I wonder where the power of God is in the churches. We wonder why, why relationships, marriages are getting ripped apart by the scenes. Where, why kids have to go to mom and dad one day or mom one week and dad the next week. We wonder why there's no power behind the pulpits. Because there's too much immorality going on inside the church. Amen. It's going on in the church, friend. In Acts, that same story of Paul, that pastor was reading that letter on. That after they got to the shore, the ship busted apart. Paul was trying to help everybody. They couldn't see anything. It was dark. They couldn't see the sun. They couldn't see the stars. They didn't have no weather app, friend. They had to look up to know where they were going, which means they had no idea where they were going. The whole time, Paul was saying, I believe God. I believe God. Be of good cheer. 
And then he gets out on the shore and he decides to help everyone to make a fire. He decides to make a fire. He's, he's bundling sticks, I believe is how the Bible says it. And, he, and out of the heat came a viper, came a snake. You know, what, you know what I'm trying to say? Sometimes in the church, friend, that's when the snake comes up and gets you. What did Paul do? He shook it off and kept going. He shook it off and kept going. The immorality going on in the church needs to stop. We need to shake it off, quit flirting with it, and walk the other way. That's why nothing's happening in the churches. It's mean. I know it sounds mean. That's what's happening in the churches, friend. The stories I hear, brothers in Christ call me, such and such left my church. What happened? And they tell me the stories, and I'm like, why? Why? Because we walk the gray line as Christians today. We walk the gray line. We give in. We flirt with the devil. David's family was affected by what he did. Go read it. Go read it. I'm sick just thinking about it. Go read what happened to David's family. That was judgment of what he did. Adam and Eve, what they gave up, affects all of us. Today, it affects us. It'll affect us till we die. The sin, we have to fight that flesh every single day. Giving in to what you want, you're going to lose what you have and you're going to affect those around you. You're going to affect all the people around you, whether you think you will or not. Kings were supposed to be in battle and David decided not to be there. When David decided to, to commit the sin that he had committed, what did David lose? Not only did he have judgment on his family, and you, you, you can go read that in the Bible and see what happened. But David lost his purity. He was a king that was respected. And he lost his purity. If the people didn't know about it, he lost his purity to God in God's eyes. He, lo he lost his purity. He lost his posterity. He was a king, friend. He was in charge. He was in control. We have pastors behind the pulpit giving into the flesh, losing their posterity, going to jail. Because they're walking the gray line. The fields will harvest. You will reap what you sow. Quit flirting with the devil. I don't know who needs to hear it. I didn't want to preach this. I was sitting there saying, God, give me something else to preach. Give me something else to preach. I have a sermon on that letter. I have a sermon on that letter that Pastor wrote. I said, that's my sign. I'm preaching something different. God said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know what you're supposed to preach. He told me it the day Pastor asked me to preach. And I tried my best to get away from it. I don't know who needs to hear it. You may not be in here. You may be watching me online. But it's not worth flirting with the devil. You will get caught up in something that you'll wish you never got caught up in. Christians, Christians, we need to realize what we have is more important than what our flesh wants. You will reap what you sow. How do you be sure? How do we be sure to stay close to God? In the book of James, God says, draw nigh unto me. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Be humble. Realize you're not all that. Realize you're nothing without God because you aren't. Neither am I. Neither is pastor. We need God. But if we flirt with the devil, we're going to lose the power of God. Amen. We're going to lose the power of God. I'm nothing behind this pulpit without Jesus. Pastor is nothing behind this pulpit without God. Brother Valance, Brother Wilson, Brother Tekel, all the teachers that teach, Brother, Brother Rick, all the teachers that teach in Sunday school are nothing without God. Nothing. It is pointless to get up here and teach or preach if you don't have the power of God. How do you lose it? Flirting with the devil. And we're doing it all over. It's easy. It's easy. They're in here. They're in here. They're in here. Who? The demons, the spirits. They hate it. They hate it. I saw a picture of, of, of the pride parade and it said, not today, Jesus. We're getting your children. We're getting your children. We need to stand strong. We need to put up a wall. We need to say, we're not walking the gray line no more. It's black and white. It's yes and no. And we need to stand for what's right. And most of us need to quit flirting with the devil. I'll say it a thousand times. Quit flirting with the devil. You're going to lose something way more important than what your flesh wants. You will get a temporary pleasure and lose something that is everlasting. You will lose something that is everlasting. Something that comforts you when you need it. Something that can fill a, a, a void in your heart that you need, friend. You need it. Don't give it up. It's sad. I have friends who gave into the devil. They flirted with the devil and they lost what they had. They hate me now. They hate us. They hate us. 
You have people that either love you or hate you when you're standing for what's right. Amen. I get two reactions, two different reactions when someone says, what church you from? What church you from? Now, I'm proud of it. I go to Temple Baptist Church, Fountain City, Knoxville, Tennessee. Pastor Charles Lawson. Brother, let me tell you, up at this camp I'm at, you are respected very, very highly. I have three different gentlemen say, my bucket list is to come hear your pastor in person. I say, come on down. He'd love to have you. But you get two reactions when you're truly not flirting with the devil and it's black and white. You either get that kind of reaction or, I know it don't hurt your feelings, I've had the same response. They, they it's the opposite. Oh, oh, you listen to that guy? I sure do. Amen. I sure do. And I'm proud of it. And I will until the day that the Lord calls this man home. Because he doesn't flirt with the devil. He makes the line black and white. He says it how it is. He doesn't give in to the immorality of this world. He doesn't flirt with the line. That's what I like. That's what I like. Don't flirt with the gray line. Don't flirt with the devil. The fields will harvest. God knows. God's watching you. God is watching you. He knows everything you're thinking. He knows everything you're doing. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. The demons are smart. The spirits are smart. They know how to get you. Whew. I had a lady from this church warn me of a situation. I thought I was stronger than I truly am. And I, in my head, I said, Psh, psh, I ain't scared of nothing. I got Jesus. I got Jesus. No, friend, you got to be close to Jesus. You got to draw nigh to Jesus. You have to humble yourself. I was humbled real quick. You can ask that lady. I came back to her and said, you were right and I was wrong. And I should have listened to you because they're smart, friend. They're smart. They got Samson. They got David. They got Adam and Eve. They got tons of people. They get us all the time. Don't flirt with the devil. It ain't worth it. Be cautious. Be cautious. Know what you're doing. Know where you're going. Know who these people are. Know what you're listening to. Know the spirit in the place. Know it, friend. Be close enough with God that you can know. Be close enough with God that you don't even have to worry about flirting with the line. Know that you know that you know that you got Jesus right next to you. That Jesus is with you. My relationship with God is not nearly as strong as it needs to be. I can guarantee you that. But when I was in this specific situation, the Lord inside of me said, Oh, you should have listened. Oh, you should have listened. Oh, you should have listened. And I almost started crying. I started shaking. And I was thinking, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I listen? Because Satan knew how to get me to flirt with the devil. He knew how to get me. He knew how to draw me in. It looked good. It sounded good. Sounded nice. Thought they were my friend. Thought they cared about me. I was just doing it out of compassion. Be careful, friend. Satan knows your weaknesses. He knows if your weakness is compassion. He knows if your weakness is generosity. Those are good attributes to have. But he knows. I had someone tell me, watch out for your compassion. You have it to a fault. You have it to a fault. And I thought, I've been told that once before, but I don't understand. I understand now. Because Satan, Satan got it to where I was flirting with him. Out of my compassion. He knew how to get me. Pastor told me, once you start preaching, once people start asking you to come out and preach, once Satan knows you're doing something, he's coming after you. He's coming after you. He's coming after you. He's coming after you. And if you are sitting in here tonight saying, Satan, don't come after me. Well, that means you're in no way a threat to him. Which means you're either with him or you're sitting on the bench doing nothing. Both of those are wrong. Both of those are unbiblical. You need to be doing something for Jesus. Amen. If Satan is attacking you, that's how you know that you're doing something. Amen. Know the line. Know that you can win. Know that Jesus is with you. Know that you don't have to worry about it. Be cautious, friend. Don't give up what you have for what you want. It ain't worth it. I'm warning you tonight. I don't know who needs to hear it. But I'm warning you right now, quit flirting with the devil. I can feel it. I can feel it. Quit flirting with the devil. Right. Satan is fighting me. He's tearing me apart. He fought me the whole drive down here. I drove two hours to preach here tonight to drive back to Greenville when I leave this building. The whole time Satan was telling me stuff and telling me stuff and telling me stuff. And then, of course, he used the people in my life to do something. 
wherever you're at, Satan, I have Jesus. You're in here somewhere. I don't know who he's in. I don't know who it is, but I have Jesus. We're not scared of you no more. We're not flirting with you no more. Leave. We want you gone. We're not going to flirt with you no more. We're not going to draw the line in the sand and, and kind of like make it wider. No. Get out. Get out. Leave. Now. It was scary, friend. It was scary. I'm telling you a personal account. It was scary. Do not give in to the devil. Don't flirt with him. It was an experience like no other. I saw Satan himself. I saw, I felt, I felt it. I didn't see him physically, but I felt it in my soul. He wanted me. He almost got me physically. He almost used somebody to get me physically. I'm telling you. Because inside my soul, I was scared of the spirit. But in my flesh, I was scared of the person standing in front of me. I thought I was going to have to shoot somebody. It's not a joke, friend. Satan wants you. He wants your kids. He's trying to tear us apart. Quit flirting with the devil. It's a personal account. It is not worth it. And then I met with the people of this church. I said, I almost lost everything I had. I don't know why I even went there. I don't know why I even did it. And one of them told me it was just out of compassion. We told you you're compassionate to a fault. Satan knows how to get you. My heart was genuine. I was just trying to help somebody. And Satan knew it. And he struck at me. He struck at me, friend. Don't flirt with the devil. It's not worth it. Samson will tell you it's not worth it. David will tell you it's not worth it. Adam and Eve will tell you it's not worth it. Peter will tell you it wasn't worth it. Denying Christ three times. It is not worth it. Quit flirting with the devil. The fields will harvest. It will get you. You're, you will reap what you're sowing, friend. You will. If you plant a certain seed, that's what's growing. All you got to do is plant it once. You have the opportunity not to water it. You have the opportunity to intentionally kill it. Or you have the opportunity to water it, feed it, give it what it needs. Satan wants you to give it what it needs. It'll grow. It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Before you know it, it'll take you over. Don't flirt with the devil. It's not worth it. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to preach. God, I love you, Lord. You're so good to me. You protected me and you cared for me. I take for granted everything you've given me. Thank you for protecting me. Thank you for taking care of me. Thank you for the people in this church who care for me, watch after me. Thank you for a pastor who prays. God, I pray that if there's anyone in here or anyone watching this, that they will realize it is not worth flirting with the devil. And they need to decide now they're going to give it up. And they're not going to flirt with the devil. They're not going to walk the gray line. Thank you, God, for everything you've given us. It's in your son's perfect, precious name I pray. Amen.